Bonjour. Hello, everyone. Tanse. Kapemote eskiesko and additional cars, new nakon and donjiba, makwando, dem, nijim dewen, nehiawa squirrel. Um, I just introduced myself in the language of the territory that I'm situated upon in recognition um, of the Anishinaabe ancestors that are present, um, embodied inside the landscape and inside the waters. I'm really excited to be here today um, to talk about uh, walking the talk, activating for the water. And just before we begin, I just invite everyone to ground themselves. Um, for us as Indigenous people, um, we consider the water that we, we open up the space in a good way to talk about some, some serious matters when it comes to the water. And so I invite you um, to ground yourself, however that, whatever that looks like for you, um, whatever your traditions are, I invite you to take a few moments to just reflect um, and, 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 and have gratitude, have gratitude for the day that is, that is about to become, for the week that's coming. We say miigwech to the, to the directions, all of the directions that we acknowledge. We acknowledge um, that doorway in the east, um, where that first life comes through. We acknowledge that doorway in the south um, and where our youth are represented. We acknowledge that doorway in the west where all our ancestors exist. And again, we acknowledge that doorway in the north for all our old ones, um, those ones who are, who are getting ready to, to go through that western doorway. I say miigwech to Shkaku the, the mother, the mother earth that um, that we rely upon for life, as well as Nibe for all the bodies of water in all of her beautiful, beautiful forms. I say miigwech, I say to, to all those, to the rain, the snow that's yet to come, to the, to the lakes and the rivers and, and the waters that flow underneath us. I say miigwech to all of those things, all of those bodies. And uh, I'm, I'm just really excited to be here and I look forward to engaging with all of you can I ask you to miigwech? Thank you. Thank you, Tasha, for those important words to open this conversation about walking the talk and activating for the water. My name is Arlene Slocum, and um, I'm, I'm here in my home along the banks of the really beautiful Aramasa River here in Dish With One Spoon territory in Mississauga of the Credit Treaty lands. I've been very much looking forward to this webinar to anchor and, and ground the, the current People's Water Campaign in, in asking some very important questions that we all might hold in our minds and hearts as we listen to both Paul and Tasha this morning. As folks striving to be water protectors, it is important to look beyond the existing systems for our advocacy and ask the bigger questions of ourselves about what it might mean to move our work towards water justice. I'm grateful to Paul for the information he will share with us about several existing declarations. and very grateful to Tasha for sharing with us her reflections on activating for the water. And I just wanted to point out a couple of things that you'll see on your screen here. So we, uh, at, at the very bottom of your screen, um, you will notice that there's several icons. One is a chat box, and if you click on that, you're gonna notice um, that we're, we're populating that with some questions or thoughts that you could be reflecting on during the course of, of this webinar as you listen. And you're more than welcome to put any thoughts or reflections here in the chat box and you know, invite everybody to, to you know, check, have a look what, what the dialogue is happening there. I also just wanted to point out that there's a, a, a Q&A box that you can click on. And in there, um, over the course of our webinar, uh, you can also be including any questions that you may have. And after Paul and Tasha have, after we've listened to their words, uh, we're gonna take some time to have a moderated Q&A session. So please do consider populating that with some questions that you have and we, we um, will do our best to try to get to all of them. But I wanted to just take a quick moment here right now too, just to, to um, frame some of the 
some of the invitations that we're inviting you to consider and reflect on as you listen. And there, there, are, there are about six and you will see them in the chat box, but I thought I would speak them out so that they're in our minds and hearts as we listen. So the first one is, since we are working towards water justice, consider the opportunities to advance the written and experience water commitments highlighted today. Second is, what are some concrete and even risky, since we are dealing with power and privilege, actions that you can take to walk the talk personally? And what do you think we should do collectively or in solidarity with? And the third one is, the Black Lives Matter movement uses the phrase, the system is not broken, it is built this way. When it comes to water justice, what systems are we talking about? And how are they to be replaced by alternative ways of not just thinking, but being? And the fourth, since part of the problem is that many people have lost their sense of connection to water, what does water justice feel like to you? And how can the People's Water Campaign amplify this feeling? The fifth is, what words and or experiences do you think are critical for any water justice declaration or invitation being made for the People's Water Campaign? And the sixth for now is we all need water. When you think about someone who is not on this webinar or has never considered the current water injustices locally and globally, what ideas from this webinar today would help you talk to this person and grow this movement? And I'm sure there are many other uh, things that you may feel called individually to reflect on. And please, please do use that chat box to share your thoughts. So without further ado, we will, uh, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, who is Paul Baines. Um, with ancestry from the British Isles, Paul Baines is with Great Lake Commons Initiative and the Blue Community Coordinator for the Federation of Sisters of St. Joseph. Paul will introduce several written water statements by Indigenous leaders, nations, and organizations, bioregional and nonprofit groups, and the Catholic Church. We will learn a bit about several water statements and how they contribute to a broad water justice movement. A moment right now. So welcome Paul and thanks for your words and events. Thanks Tasha for that opening and I feel a bit more grounded now uh, speaking for the water. Um, we are all here today to uh, speak for the water and protect the water and you know renew our connection to water. My, hi my name is Paul Baines and um, I'm sitting here today by the Autonomy River in the Nishisagi Mishnabek territory here in Treaty 20. And I'd like to speak to you all today about various water statements that have been written. Um, I'll be speaking about uh, the Water Declaration, the Blue Communities, uh, Aquafon Vete, the Nibi Declaration, the Great Lakes Commons Charter, and a federal petition to recognize the Great Lakes as living entities as well. And so the reason I wanted to uh, speak today with Tasha about these water intentions is to look at both the written and unwritten expressions to, for water connection and water protection. The People's Water Campaign is also developing a water justice invitation. So I wanted to make sure that today's webinar could help inform that process. You know, for people like myself, a settler here, I don't really have any water teachings. Um, and so for me, learning about these declarations and these expressions are a way to understand some more water teachings and also many of us, including myself on this call, are still learning about how Canada's authority when it comes to lands and waters is contested by indigenous self-determination and jurisdiction. So my guiding questions for these six um, written intentions is, whose voice is being centered and who are these intentions uh, written for? What do these voices teach us about water justice? How are these intentions being used towards their goal? And what kind of agency is really being animated? How are we redefining what power is? So if you'll go on with me a little journey here, I'm gonna go through some of these water declarations um, and I'll try to answer those first two questions uh, to start with and we'll open it up for Tasha and I in discussion with the rest of you on, on all these questions as well. The first declaration I'd like to introduce you to was written in 2008. And it's the Water Declaration of the Anishinaabek, Meshkiwek, and Ongwehone of Ontario. Several parts to it, but this was adopted by the Chiefs and Assembly by, 
consensus. It's really about the inherent responsibilities and the intimate relationships these nations have with water. And when we speak about water, we're not just talking about, you know, tap water or groundwater, but this declaration really opens up of all the various forms of water. It really does, like many of these declarations, uh, recognize women as the keepers of the water, honoring the spirit through, through ceremony, ceremonies given by, by the creator. What's important about declarations like this is it, it reinforces the fact that these nations have their own laws and protocols and that this care is part of a relationship with the creator. Relationships with the crown are also important. These are in the form of treaties, for instance. And these treaties did not, unlike many of us may have learned in, in television or history class, these treaties were not about handing over decision-making to the crown. Uh, indigenous nations are not just stakeholders. So this is an example of um, proclaiming, you know, the, the role of first peoples on Turtle Island with both rights and responsibilities to protect water for present and future generations. So the document goes on with a long list of the poor conditions of these waters uh, as they've been sort of dwindling the last 150 plus years, and that these waters are increasingly governed by foreign economic values that alienate their own relationships to, with each other and the waters. But lastly, I wanted to highlight the fact that this declaration is, is reminding us that the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples reaffirms their right to self-determination to pursue their own economic, social, and cultural development. But they also have rights given by the Creator and recognized by the Constitution of Canada and international law. So that was the first declaration I wanted to uh, introduce you to for those who didn't already know, uh, because a lot of time when we speak about um, water permits or water pollution, we forget that this jurisdiction around water and territory uh, isn't just in the sole domain of Ontario or, or Canada. A different kind of declaration is this Blue Communities one. And I speak to you today wearing a several hats. One of the work, some of the work I do is with the Sisters of St. Joseph. And uh, about two plus years ago, they became a Blue Community. The Blue Communities project encourages municipalities, indigenous communities, and even religious organizations like the Federation of Sisters of St. Joseph to support the idea of a water commons framework, recognizing that water is a shared resource for all by passing various resolutions. So this was originally started by the Council of Canadians by water uh, warriors such as Maude Barlow. So there's three main principles to this type of water declaration and that is to recognize water and sanitation as human rights, to ban or to phase out the sale of bottled water in municipal facilities or at municipal events. But again, this could be done for any organization. Uh, I think McGill University campus is also a blue community. And so the various blue communities can interpret and adapt these principles in their own way. Lastly, they also wanna promote publicly financed, owned and operated water and wastewater services. So, so far there's 75 of these blue communities internationally, including Los Angeles, um, a, a First Nation in the, what's now called British Columbia, the, I won't even tell, Sik Stokmik territory, one of the first First Nations in, on, in Canada to become a blue community, but also a city in Brazil and also Paris, just to name a few. There's more about the blue community's um, work in Maud Barlow's latest book, Whose Water Is It Anyway? Um, taking water protection into public hands. So here we have an example of a nonprofit organization um, also trying to articulate what it means to be a good water protector and how we can go about doing so. Speaking of another kind of organization, the Catholic Church recently put out a, uh, a document. The Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development put out a document called Aquafons Beate which translates into water is a source of life. And we can see a lot of connecting themes across these various water declarations, which again, I hope we can use to discuss further in today's webinar, but also can help inform the people's water, um, the people's water campaign and the declaration around water justice. But here again, we're looking at ways in which we can um, take evangelical principles and animate them into concrete action. There are various uh, Catholic social teachings about human dignity, the common good, solidarity, and justice. 
uh, to really help inform a new development paradigm. You know, we just passed the 10 year mark of the United Nations General Assembly commitment to, to the, the universal right to water and sanitation. And there's been very slow progress on that. Not only do we have uh, over 800 million people in the world without clean, safe access to drinking water, as some of us know, there are over 100 First Nations in Canada that currently do not have this right respected either. So this document is well researched with making connections to climate change, privatization, obviously pollution of fresh waters and oceans, and again, the unjust distribution of water and democratic control. What distinguishes this water declaration from many of the other uh, non-Indigenous declarations that I've seen is that it really does affirm water's role in ceremony and healing, in beauty and wonder, peacemaking, and really vitality across our common home. So while it also values the utility of water for human use, the Castry authors prefer to help readers understand a deeper and more soulful relationship with water. So they have several proposals in each of the sections. This is like a 25 page document, um, but ba basically these are many of the goals that some of the partners of the People's Water Campaign are working on in terms of plastics, uh, human rights, water. Again, third one there, really paying attention to society's most marginal. That's the language of the document. And lastly, I think it's an interesting one to think about how water protection and water care and water ceremony is an active process of dialogue and uniting people in a sort of peacemaking um, possibilities. I wanted to point out this um, declaration as well. This is the Nibi Declaration of Treaty 3. Um, Nibi is the Anishinaabe Moan word for water. And I think it's important to question whose language many of these intentions are written in. And um, obviously, language and words are, are not just syntax, they are windows into worlds and relationships. And so I think it's important to, if we're thinking about justice and we're thinking about repairing harm, uh, not just protecting water, um, we think about the language we're using and whose language and how can we use language to again open up uh, ways of connecting. And so Treaty 3 is this large uh, territory uh, going from west of Thunder Bay to, to Sioux Lookout uh, to the province of Manitoba, made up of 28 um, First Nation communities. And they developed their own uh, water declaration. So again, pulling on various examples, different types of authorship, different types of intentions here when it comes to defining co written commitments to water protection, water care, water responsibility. So again, this, they've actually developed a 20 page, 26 page toolkit to help facilitate the meaning and the, and the support of this document. It's really just a one page uh, declaration. And it was again developed by the, by the Treaty Grand Council, Treaty Number no. Three Women's Council. And we'll see that theme running through this work as well as we see the leadership of women in the protection of water. So this is the declaration to guide leadership in the creation of future policy and decision-making that relate to water, and also to guide a relationship with youth future generations, and with Nibi herself. And so um, I know we try to uh, never speak about water without having water in the room. And I think it's really important to bring Nibi, to bring water into our, even our virtual spaces um, as we talk about her and we think about our connection and our responsibilities. And so these declarations are not just about human to human declarations, human to human commitments and agreements, but also uh, human to, to creation, uh, relationships as well. So here are some of the key themes of this declaration are that water is alive and has spirit, and thus it cannot be owned or controlled. It's shared across lands and between peoples, doesn't really respect political boundaries uh, in the current form. And again, similar to the first declaration we looked at, it has many forms, including snow, ice, spring water, salt water, and beyond. But I think it's really important to point out birth waters as one of the waters in which we need to be mindful of when thinking about our sacred and shared relationships with water. So often the colonial structures have divided water up into so many different jurisdictions. You know, there is, there is the weather people doing the rain, I suppose. There's navigable waters, there's groundwater, there's fresh water. And these are all different ministries, different levels of government. And we can see how this fragmentation of water governance has 
you know, really made it difficult to protect water in all of its forms. And when we think about gender and we think about um, creation and we think about the next generation, if we include birth waters into our deeper understanding about our responsibilities to water, I personally think it's, it, it helps, um, again, make those connections that for, the, for most, of, most of our indigenous histories was never broken, but has more in the Western way, in the colonial way, has been separated and uh, been degraded as what water is and where water is. So again, water being the source of our well-being, spirituality, both physical, mental, emotional, and that we all have a sacred relationship with Nidhi. Women have a special responsibility, and this relationship is preserved through ceremony and teachings shared between generations. So I wanted to use a quick map of, uh, you can see here, uh, the province of what is, what is now called the province of Ontario. And again, this, this water declaration has a whole toolkit, unlike the other ones, has a whole toolkit to help implement and further its, its power. So bear with me, I've just got a couple more. I wanted to speak about the Great Lakes Commons Charter Declaration. Another one of the hats I'm wearing today is uh, a person who's been involved with the Great Lakes Commons for many years. And um, I didn't create this, this charter, but in 2012, after two years of collabor collaborative work, this charter declaration highlighted several, I think, key pieces, which we can be reminded about as we think about this water justice campaign in Ontario. We had some Americans in the group, and so they started off th this declaration with we the people of the Great Lakes, which I think is illustrative of some of our histories. Um, and so as you can tell from the beginning, this one is very much centering um, the, the Great Lakes as its sort of collective uh, sort of human body and wanting to, I guess, take the language that is normally associated with nation states, um, we the people of the United States, for instance, and to sort of rethink our allegiance and our citizenship to not being towards a certain state, um, um, but towards a land base, towards a, a territory. Um, here again, we see the themes of not being, what, not treating water as a, as, a, as a resource and as a source of life instead. This document addresses our responsibility and care and, and acting on behalf of these waters, which is easier said than done. What does acting on behalf of these waters mean? The health of the waters is intertwined with the health of, our, of, of ourselves and that of generations to come. And commons be actually being this word which links the ideas of gift and responsibility and the, how the Great Lakes are one interconnected watershed. The Great Lakes suffer from many issues, one of which being that they're so fragmented in terms of their jurisdiction. We have different provinces and different states and different countries, all responsible for different pieces of the Great Lakes. And yet they are still one interconnected watershed, but to this day, uh, they are not really governed as one uh, in the modern sense. This is a declaration which actually is accompanied by a set of first principles. Um, and the two of these things form a larger whole. It's really difficult to come up with um, a declaration to speak um, with the voice of the diversity of voices that are currently in the Great Lakes. Um, as we can always sort of see, there is a con contested way, either with different language, uh, different understandings of our role in the world, um, different, different worldviews. And so when we talk about the People's Declaration, we really need to respect the diversity of the, of the various peoples within that, and that not everybody in Canada considers themselves Canadians, for instance. And so a, a, co a accompanying or, or putting together these first principles, which um, I can connect you to in the, in the notes of the slides. Um, again, form a larger whole, that this is an ongoing process. The key part of this charter declaration is really recognizing the inherent sovereignty and rights of indigenous peoples as codified in treaties, international agreements, and really must be upheld as foundational to commons, commons governance. Um, this is a, a work in progress. Uh, if anybody has any great examples of how this is being done, I'd love to hear about it. So lastly, the, the document is aspirational and it's not directed towards any governments. Um, it is really about a sort of who, what are you going to do to, to enliven and animate this charter? So in part it reads, we join our voices in affirming the spirit and necessity of this declaration as the foundation for a renewed relationship and mode of governance. You know, there's probably about 10 different Great Lakes conferences every year 
about various issues, but almost none of them are about governance. They're usually about pollution control or management or monitoring um, or about all the various issues. But the issue of governance is usually left off the table. And so lastly, this charter ends with, in signing this charter, we embrace our responsibility, individual and collective, to act on behalf of these waters and future generations. So we can see again, some overlapping themes here with some of the declarations before. The very last um, written water intention I'd like to share with you as hopefully a way to inform our discussion here about how do we walk the talk? Um, how do we put water justice into action within 2020, within all of the contested ways in which various social movements, various ways of authority are being contested as many Canadians are waking up to realize that the Canada they thought they live in isn't, the same, isn't, isn't what they thought when it comes to uh, you know, the popular statues of, the, of our founders of our, this so-called nation. And we're living through a time of tremendous change. And so this last, um, this last example is a petition that was launched um, through the Green Party of Canada, but really initiated by Waseka Min, uh, also known as Edward George. And you'll be hearing from, from uh, Wasekam in on the for the watersheds 2020 event on september 26th uh he's been doing a lot, a lot of work in this area for many years um and he's a great example of someone who's both working in the written word and through his actions as well and so some of us may have heard of this idea of rights of nature or, or personhood uh but here we have um another example here in this context so this, um, this petition documents quite clearly the need for uh, protection beyond legislation. Um, basically, this is for everyone's benefit, but that we can't every four years you know, be reliant on various governments passing legislation. The issues of water protection need a more uh, holistic and, and again, indefinite perspective. Obviously, we can, we can talk further about that within this current system in which industry has an overriding influence and the paradigm of economic growth, that the Canadian government is fundamentally flawed to protect the Great Lakes. And so we need a different form of political power, of protection power, that isn't reliant on um, governments that focus on four-year cycles and are, again are, are biased towards uh, economic paradigms. And so this is a strategy to to sort of, again, don't keep doing the same types of actions expecting different results, right? So it's, it goes on to say, we the undersigned indigenous, non-indigenous peoples of the Great Lakes, First Nations, Métis and Inuit, and citizens of Canada. So we can see the differences there. Call upon the House of Commons and Parliament, assemble to undertake a process by which to formally acknowledge the Great Lakes as living entities. Lastly, the, it calls on support for the formation of a multi-interest tribunal led by Indigenous peoples. And um, it, this was launched and opened up uh, May 26, 2017, and within a short few weeks received uh, 1,522 signatures. So with the time I have left, I just wanted to uh, summarize that each of these declarations is very different in terms of whose voice is being centered and the intentions of it. Uh, but there, there's a lot we can learn here about what we mean by, or what we could mean by water justice. So here we have examples of the nation, of the municipality, the First Nation, the organization, the church, the treaty partner, the bioregion, and even indigenous youth uh, expressing their voice on behalf of the waters in these various examples that I've tried to respectfully summarize for you today. But, but more importantly, I think, what do these voices teach us about water justice? And then I'll hand it over to Tasha. So there's a bit of a list here I've created, and by, by no means is this an exhaustive list. But these are some of my takeaways looking at these six declarations. There can be no justice within the current colonial system. Water is a sacred, this is all about sacred and gift relationships. We need to respect both responsibilities and rights, that we are the very water in which we are trying to protect. We are part of this watershed. Water has its own responsibilities. Here we think, need to think about beyond our own human utility ideas and that water has, it, has a, a purpose and, and responsibilities given to, to her as well. And we need to respect that if we're going to do um, just water governance. All of creation and future generations matter. 
Centering Indigenous Teachings and Governance and the Role of Women. So these, these are part of this, the recentering. There can be no justice within extractive and within a growth system. That ceremony is part of governance. We need to expand, for many of us, we need to expand and deepen our understanding of what governance is. It's not just things that happen in courts or in, in parliaments, for instance, um, or even in citizen assemblies. It goes deeper than beyond than uh, these, some of these forms. And, uh, the province of Ontario just was asking for people's comments regarding water permits, but there's no space in these public processes to really in, in, in induce and support ceremony as part of a governance work. Uh, lastly, water comes in many forms and we need to sort of govern water with that perspective, including, like I mentioned, the birth waters. The governance is participatory, so let's get involved here. Let's move from the abstract into action and many more. So I want to thank everybody for listening. I hope that was useful and part of this ongoing process of uniting across differences on behalf of the water as part of the watershed. And I'm uh, hoping that we'll also learn a lot from Tasha before we have some discussion today. So thanks for your time and your interest. Thanks very much, Paul, for your description of the declarations about the water as life. And, and next, we're gonna hear from Tasha Beads, who will talk about the importance of being in relationship with water. Tasha Beads is a professor and PhD candidate in Indigenous Studies of Nehewa Ancestry. She is second degree Midiwewan member from Minwewewigon Lodge out of Russo River and Wikwemakong Unceded Reserve. As a water walker and midday woman, Tasha is dedicated to moving in ceremony for the water, lands, and for the generations to come. She's firmly committed to the continual resurgence and revitalization of Indigenous thought, knowledges, and sovereignty. She brings her experience and stories of the water as a water walker, having walked for the water for over 10 years under the guidance of the late water walker, grandmother and advocate, Josephine Mandamanba. Following in the footsteps of her late mentor and teacher, Tasha advocates the water's voice to be heard, listened to, and activated inside of all of us. Thanks, Tasha, for joining us today. Ani, bonjour, Tanse, again. I uh, just want to say miigwech to both Arlene and to Paul for that, uh, for that time spent on Nibe. Um, I've already introduced myself in the language of the territory that um, I'm personally situated in, which is in Niswakamuk or uh, Sudbury as it's known in English. And I think Paul had brought up um, language and the importance of language and um, the importance of, of asking whose voice, um, whose voice is at the forefront. And, you know, I, I start off um, with acknowledging Nibe, um, the water. And I think that voice is always um, is always the voice that we need to pay attention to the most. And uh, that's one of the teachings that I received from my mentor and uh, my teacher, um, Josephine Bahmandaman, um, the original water walker, um, the Anishinaabe Kwe Ogichita, Anishinaabe Kwe Ogichita, Nibe Ogichita, that that warrior for the water. Um, that's one of the things that she taught me is to, uh, it's not about us. It really is about the water first. We have to do it for the water, right? Walking the talk, the title of this webinar is in reference to, to her words. Those are the words that she always used to say, you have to walk the talk, right? You can't just talk. Um, and so that brings us back to this idea of language and the importance of language, the, the importance of understanding um, what is conveyed through our word choices. And I look at some of the, the declarations that Paul has introduced. And, and of course, the one in 2017 uh, from Wasakum, he initiated that under the 2017 um, For the Earth and Water Walk. And so Anishinaabek people have had this relationship, indigenous peoples in general have had relationships with the water um, from a very different perspective. And again, it's with the idea that the water herself is a living entity. 
and the water as a living entity comes to us in multiple forms, whether that be the rain or the ocean or the spring water, the groundwater, the snow and the ice. And, and like, uh, like Paul mentioned, our birth waters, right? Those of us who have had the fortune of being, um, of being that doorway for life, part of life itself is the water. And the ramifications and the beauty of that is very deeply profound when you take the time to enter into that knowledge and enter into that relationship with Nibbe herself, Nibbi, as we say in Plains Cree. Um, and, you know, the perspective that I bring is just one of many. I have been influenced by Anishinaabe understandings of the water because of my mentorship um, with, with Josephine Ba, because I walked with her, um, because I walked with grandmothers like Shirley um, Williams and Liz Zwamek. I walked all around the Kortha Lakes. I walked around all of the Great Lakes. Um, and so my experiences, my, my knowledge um, in terms of my own relationship with the water is rooted within Anishinaabe understandings. And I'm also a Medeque, right? I belong to uh, Minwewig and Medewin Lodge out of Wikwemkung and out of Roseau River. And many of our understandings, my own personal understandings come from that particular uh, society and that particular um, knowledge bundle, not saying that there isn't, there's many other people's perceptions um, when it comes to indigeneity. However, the common thread is that recognition that the water and the earth are living. Um, and that's very different than, than water is a source of life, right? Because when you shift that, when you take, when you take just a source of life, it's, it's, it, is, it is life, right? So water is life. Um, we pay very close attention to language within indigenous concepts and within the scope of indigenous languages. When you understand some of the, the concepts embedded inside of our languages, it opens up an entirely new way of, of seeing the world. And once you, once you begin to see the world through the lens of our own ancestors, um, the world becomes a very, very different place. And so, you know, the idea that we could have, we could own a body of water, it's, it's akin to, like, how could we own another living being? How can we own somebody else? Because Nibe or Nipi, the water, the sources, the bodies of water are seen exactly as that that we look slightly different, right? What is it that we're 80% we're water, 70% water, um, according to a scientific perspective, speaking of. So we're, we are water as well. And the only difference between us and that lake or Lake, lake Superior, as, as it's known in, in English, um, the difference between us and those bodies it's only 30%, right? And when I began to, when I became a water walker, it was the first time that I, I really began to be conscious of those bodies because they're very different. Each body of water has, has a different personality. And the only way you can recognize that is when you enter into a relationship with those bodies of water. And so the idea that, you know, that, that we can own water or that we can sell water, it's, it's, very, it's very deeply disrespectful, right? The idea that we um, are polluting the source of life herself is deeply disturbing. And it's what drove um, it's what drove those grandmothers, those early grandmothers who began water walking back in like 2003. Um, even before that, though, there was, there was 
conceptualizations of of the need for the message to get across that like this is it we only get one chance and we have to come to a different understanding in order to look ahead right and when we talk about responsibility we talk about our obligation we talk about relationship um and so you know, I'm a grandmother. I have two beautiful, beautiful granddaughters who are like, they are my everything. And I'm an auntie. I have so many nieces and nephews. I have Anishinaabe nieces. I have Cree nieces and nephews, other indigenous nations. I've been fortunate to be, to be called auntie. And I take those roles, auntie and, and kokum, uh, nokomis, very, very seriously. And it's part of that understanding right? That we have to look ahead. It's not just about us. Just not, it's not just about us, right? Um, this idea that, that it's only about us is very foreign from an Indigenous perspective, from an Indigenous consciousness. And, and I think that's what has to shift. If you're talking about giving primacy, I think our consciousness has to shift. And that's something that, that Joba advocated for, right? We, we need to look ahead. Seven times seven, that was one of her favorite phrases. Seven times seven generations. You ha you know, seven generations ago, someone was looking ahead for us, for you, right? You may not know who you, you know, some people are like, well, I was adopted. You may, you may not know where it is that you've come from. Even if you don't, your ancestors know you. That's the beauty of our understandings. Your ancestors know you. They don't, you don't need to know exactly. Maybe you were adopted. Maybe you were, you were part of that foster care system um, and you have no idea where it is you've come from. That's okay. Maybe the, the lines of, of that, those ancestral lines were interrupted by the processes of colonization, both for as an indigenous person and as a non-indigenous person. Maybe you simply don't know. It doesn't matter from our perspective, your ancestors will know. And somewhere seven generations ago, someone was thinking about you with love, with absolute pure love, wanting the best for you, wanting you to understand your place in creation. And I think for me, I realized that even more so the minute that my son put my first granddaughter in my arms and then, then a second granddaughter, the minute that he placed those babies in my arms, I could see ahead, right? And my love for them is beyond anything that I can imagine. My love ahead thinking, you know, I, I may be someone's ancestor and knowing that is, is all the responsibility and obligation that I need to do. I will do everything I can to make the world a better place for my children and my grandchildren to come. And part of that understanding is rooted in indigenous ways of knowing and indigenous intellectual legacies. Colonization didn't win, right? We're still here and we're still carrying our medicine with us because seven generations ago, someone loved us enough to make sure that we would always be able to enter into those relationships with the world around us. They gave us the tools that we would need, right? To understand who Nebe was and what happens when you enter into that relationship with her. In, in, any of her forms. You know, one of the things that Joba, she always, always used to remind us, right? Like, you know, how it storms, you know, sometimes the snow comes and it's cold and rainy or miserable. She's like, do not curse the water. Do not be miserable. Do not, you know, uh, uh, take out your frustrations on the water. Oh, you know, this rain is horrible. I just hate this rain. She was like, that in and of itself is uh, not conducive, right? You're, 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 you're impacting that relationship with that particular form of water. Um, and it's so powerful when you, when you begin to understand, like I said, I can't go into it in, in 20, 25 minutes, but if you have the opportunity to listen to 
actually genuinely listen to who we are as indigenous people in our respective nations, in our respective territories, because my relationship with the water is going to be very different than say someone who's from British Columbia, right? I'm a prairie girl. I didn't grow up with the, with the ocean. So, you know, I grew up with, with uh, the Saskatchewan River, right? So that is, is, a, is a body of water that I'm going to enter into a relationship that I have a relationship with. Um, it doesn't preclude you from, from entering into those relationships. Like I said, I moved here to the territory of the Anishinaabe and I was able to enter into a relationship. I put the time and the energy and the effort into understanding who these bodies of water um, were, right? And so like anything else, you can't just walk up to, you know, you just can't walk up to, to a body of water or to a form of water and be like, hey, I'm, you know, this is who I am. What can I get from you? What can I take from you? Because what would, how would you feel? How would you feel if someone was like, I'm going to own you, I'm going to bottle you up, I'm going to sell you, right? When you begin to understand that the water has life, that the water is life, that the water is a living energy that has memory, right? That's the other key. The water has memory. She remembers who enters into relationships with her and she remembers who disrespects her. And, and you know, Another one of Joba's phrases was, we, we can discontinue our negligence. We have that choice. We have the free will to discontinue our negligence of Nebe, right? And so, you know, when you think about that in the context of all of these declarations, that for me is, is, is of the prime importance. We have to define what that negligence is. I mean, I'm, in some ways it's very apparent, right? But in other ways it isn't. So it's up to us as, as individuals, we have that autonomy and we have that choice to discontinue our negligence in, in each step of the way from the very smallest step, like turning off the tap water to the very larger steps of advocating, right? Advocating for not just us and our immediate family to discontinue our negligence, but for the, the larger world to discontinue the negligence. Because once that water is gone, and, and you can speak to many of our own community members who, uh, who don't have access, right? We, we are in positions of privilege. If you can turn on the tap, that's privilege. If you can crawl into the tub and, and not worry about there being any kind of chemical residues or any kind of um, poison or, or, or any kind of anything that will harm you inside, the, that's privilege. Many of our own people, as Indigenous people, we don't have that. We, that and, and you don't have to go to the far north, right? There's this kind of idea that, that only people in the far north have, have water issues. Serpent River, just down the road, they have no access to water. They have to bottle their water in. Same with other communities down south. Um, many, many communities where I come from, uh, you know, my, my auntie and uncle lived on uh, Mr. Wass's reserve. There was no way you could ever drink that water, you know, and, and, and you didn't want to bathe in it either to be blunt, because it, it had le left such a crust, the water was not living anymore. And so, you know, th there's so, there's so much that, that we can, we can get into. But I think for me, when we're talking about giving voice, we, we have to learn to enter into those relationships. And if you don't know how to do that, you have to find the people who can help you learn that um, because when we're looking ahead, right? Again, that seven, going back to that seven times seven, what is, what's going to be left for our grandchildren, for our great grandchildren, seven generations from now? That is our responsibility as grandmothers, as mothers, as fathers, as aunties and uncles, right? What's going to be left? Joba dedicated her life to advocating for the water, not just water as a source or water as, a, as, as something to be controlled. Or She advocated that water is alive, 
Right. And, and I mean, when you look at science too, right, we can, we can look at Dr. Emoto who just confirmed and affirmed what indigenous people have known all along. Um, a lot of times science as it's known, um, doesn't give credibility to our way of knowing, but we have our own systems. We've had our own intellectual systems of knowing for thousands and thousands of years, and it worked for us. We didn't have any, any kind of pollution. We didn't have waters that were poisoned because we knew how to enter into those relationships. And that knowledge, albeit it has been interrupted in some communities, it was not destroyed because we're still here and we're still talking, we're still advocating, we're still trying to create those spaces for our next generations. We're trying to get people to understand just how pivotal it is for us to discontinue our negligence, as our grandmother used to say. Um, it is, it's, it's, you know, when you, when you begin to, uh, once you enter into that relationship with, with Nebe, there's no going back. Once you understand, right? Once you understand and uh, once you understand the impact that we have had as humans, not just on, because it's not just about the water herself, right? The water is connected to other entities other beings, other life forms. For us to be so egotistical, right? to put ourselves before everything else is, is to me one of the most saddest legacies of colonization. Um, because the birds, they don't have a choice. The animals, they don't have a choice. Like if, if we poison, you know, if we poison a body of water, wherever it is, you know, we have a choice as humans, you know, we, we have that choice to like bottle our, you know, ship our bottled water in. But what choice does that leave for the entities that rely upon that, that life from the smallest insect to the large, like to the bear or to the, to the other animals? And then what are we doing to ourselves, right? Because we know. And, and we all know what it is. I mean, you have to look at the, the rates of cancer, right? We, we are literally, we are literally the only beings on earth that will destroy our own home. And so, and in destroying our own home, we're destroying the home of our future generations. And that... <laughs> You know, that's probably the most heaviest part of this responsibility is to, uh, to make people know, to make people see that. Just take a, take a little glimpse into the future. And if that doesn't motivate you, then I don't know. I honestly, as a grandmother, I don't know how else to motivate you <laughs> because I want people to be motivated. On behalf of my granddaughters, I want to motivate people to to shift their consciousness when it comes to understandings of the water. And you know, water is, is big business, right? We, we see that over and over again. And I think the, the most pivotal part is if we, get, if we get that understanding that water is life, that water is living, I think if that understanding is communicated on a larger global scale, if you if you turn to your respective indigenous nations and in, in your respective the territories that you're situated in, um, I think that's the key. The key lies with us as indigenous people. It always has, um, and our elders they know this. And those of us who have, you know, come out of some of that colonial trauma. We've shaken off the colonial hangover, if you will, and, and we're aware of the power inherent inside of our ways of knowing, inside of, of our understandings, and inside of our relationships with our respective 
the respective entities, whether it be Shkaka the earth herself, or the insects or the animals, once we begin to have those relationships, there's no going back. And, and our inherent power is what is feared the most, even to this day, right? Colonialism isn't over. Colonialism is an ongoing project. And you can see that because for people to take a step back, for people to understand and recognize our inherent ways of knowing and the power inside those ways of knowing, um, the world will shift. And for many, many people, they don't want the world to shift, whether because it's their own comfort, their own economy, their power, their, their money, what have you, the legacy that we have as indigenous peoples is probably the most threatening legacy because it inherently has power and it's the kind of power that that you once you begin to understand it that that power that's inherent in our relationships with one another in our relationships with the rest of creation it's uh it changes everything. And that change, I think, is what, what some people are afraid of the most. But for us, that change could lead to a different future, a different way of being, one where our ways of knowing are, are listened to and actually respected, right? And so I don't, I don't have all the answers, but I'm gonna keep working and I'll keep advocating for people to enter into those relationships with the water. And it is really that easy. Um, you just have to get to know. You have to get to know the water around you. And that includes the water within, our, within ourselves. Um, I talked about Dr. Emoto, the scientist who had the experiments about water and how water changes, right? The actual, there's an actual molecular change. And, you know, when I began to think about that from an Anishinaabek perspective, of course, it, it makes all sense, right? We, we've known this for, for thousands of years. That knowledge has been passed down to us as mothers. And, and that was the other thing, um, you know, mothers and fathers and, and men and women, we all have a responsibility for the water. It's not just a woman's task. And I think Wasikum's journeys have, uh, and other, other men who've stood up for the water have shown us, it's not just about, it's about all of us. We need to all take those responsibilities and obligations. There is a place for, for everyone on the gender spectrum. I think that's really important to point out. Um, but if we look at what, what Dr. Emoto affirmed, we can see, right, we ourselves are, are are connected in this deep and profound way. And so really as, as indigenous people, it means returning to our ways of knowing through the lens of our own nations, our respective nations. You can't get this knowledge in an institution. You can't find this knowledge in books. It is a lived experiential knowing. And, and, our, and our people hold the key. So find your way to our respective spaces, whether that be lodges or communities or community centers. The knowledge is there for you. If you are an Indigenous person, it is your inherent legacy. If you're a non-Indigenous person, you have responsibilities and obligations as well to, to the, the ancestors of the territories that you're now situated in. Uh, because if you're non-Indigenous, your ancestors have come from somewhere else. Uh, and people have that argument, well, I've been here for seven, you know, my ancestors have been here for seven generations. Well, ours have been here for thousands. The scope of that is very, very different. And so you've agreed, your ancestors agreed inside our sacred understandings and our sacred laws, like the treaties, your ancestors agreed there are certain responsibilities and obligations on the part of non-Indigenous people. Whether you've been here for seven generations, whether you're just arriving, you have a responsibility and an obligation to the territories as well, because you're going, you're asking to, to, to make this space your home. And so in order for you to understand what those are, again, you have to find us. 
you have to know who we are and you have to respect our voice and respect our ways of knowing to get to that to that place of understanding and that place of truth and reconciliation um, there can be no reconciliation without the truth and so the truth is you need to give voice to us if you really want to learn right it has to be from our own perspectives and so you know in the end um, our people take years and years and years and years to study our ways of knowing you can't get this in an undergraduate degree in four years you have to walk the talk you have to enter into relationships with indigenous people and you have to enter into relationships with our territories with the lands and the waters of our ancestors um, and on their own terms right and so um, with that i encourage you all to uh to think about some of these things. I know it's a lot of information in a very short period of time, but I look forward to, uh, to engaging um, with, with the audience in any questions and, and to say miigwech kananaskomatan to each and every one of you for, for listening in on this webinar. And if you have questions, concerns, you know, I really encourage you to, to uh, continue the conversation with us. Again, Nahal, miigwech. Hmm. Well, thank you so much, Tasha, for this beautiful, um, powerful, and, and really moving words, and, and for the invitation for us each to, to reflect a lot on what it means to become an ancestor and a good ancestor. And, and also that phrase it has stuck with me, too, about um, really paying attention to discontinuing our negligence, and, and what does that mean for all of us? And I, I'm going to invite, um, yeah, thanks very much, Tasha, for that. My, my, my mind and heart are, are spinning and reeling right now, as I'm sure everyone else is. So I'm going to invite, yeah, Paul, excellent. Thanks for joining and Tasha back onto the screen so that we can have a, a, a bit of a discussion. Um, I've been watching and following the, the chats. And I, I think I would like to, um, you know, part of, of this webinar series that we're doing is leading towards uh, an event that's happening next Saturday where we, along the way we had, you know, many, many months ago, we had imagined ourselves coming up with or per perhaps creating a, a, a statement of our own about what water justice means and looks like. And we've realized along the way that that's going to be a, a very long process. And we've arrived at a certain point um, with some invitations for, for people to consider. But it, it the question that we put in the chat earlier is is with me right now and i'd love to invite your reflections on this so what words and or experiences do you think are critical for any water justice declaration or invitation um being made for 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 this campaign or just in general from your perspectives and maybe tasha i'll invite you to respond first and then paul if you have comments we'd love to hear great thanks arlene um Again, I go back to um, what I just reiterated about the need for inclusion, um, because these are our territories. These are our traditional ancestral territories. So if, if there's any kind of statements or any kind of water justice movements, there has to be, our voice has to be at the table, right? Because, um, because we, we are the ones who have the first relationship with these territories. And we have, you know, different understandings. And, and again, when we think about um, reconciliation, part of that, and I'll, and I'll quote my, my brother Isaac Murdoch and, and my Ogama, uh, Charlie Nelson, you know, part of that reconciliation, um, is about reconciling our actions with the land and the water and the animals um, and the, the beings, the entities that rely upon it, um, upon those relationships. And as Indigenous people, we have a particular set of responsibilities and obligations um, in line with those ancestral, um, ancestral legacies 
uh, my Ogama Charlie, he talks about it as a, as a trust, right? We're not going anywhere. As Indigenous people, we're, we're here. And we've proven that time and time and time again. And so there has to be an, an, a recognition. And I think it's, it's actually quite deeply profound. And I'm not sure um, how we're actually going to get there because it would involve a nation to nation relationship. Um, and, I, and I think, like I said before, you know, that, that is very threatening to the status quo. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a huge conversation that I think we, we, like we can't do justice in this, in this short period of time. But, but again, it's, it's our voice, inclusion giving primacy to our because these are these are our home this is our home territory right we we have nowhere else to go so to speak right um and and we love it's it's that simple we love our ancestors we love our future generations and so that love is going to inform our movement and will inform our contributions and we do have something to contribute right again we've shown that time and time again and we're, we're frequently just set aside or we're frequently added on and so yeah i i don't know if that actually answers the question but there's some some thoughts anyway it's beautiful thanks tasha it's important uh, important in centering indigenous voices yeah um paul i'm wondering if you have any re reflections on that well, I should probably disclose to everybody that we are going to be sharing this draft invitation in the coming days leading up to the Watersheds 2020. And I was a part of the advisory team that helped draft this, uh, as long as Arlene and, and a few other key individuals. So I've already had my words a little bit shared in that. I look forward to the feedback. But all I would add for today uh, is that I would, I think in terms of words, I think words like healing are really important, that if we just think about justice, or we just think about sustainability or, um, or uh, survival, I think we're, we're limiting our, our imagination and, and our deep, profound sense of, of loss. And so I think there's the, the, the words around healing are really important for me. Um, there's, a, there's a professor here at Trent University, Professor Dang Longboat, and I heard through a friend about one of his teachings uh, from his um, Honoshone teachings and around this idea of agency and that if we just see humans as the only beings with agency, we things look pretty dire. Whereas if we can also respect the fact that all of creation is, in, is following its original instructions to produce life and to recreate life, we can align ourselves with those larger life-giving forces and to see how that is part of our theory of change and how we see ourselves aligning with, with life itself and creation itself as part of our ideas of how change happens. Um, to use the words of Robin Wall Kimmerer in her, from her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, I love the line, again, to complement this idea of like the words and the actions, the walking and the talk, is we need more acts of practical reverence, I think. And so I would love to see how the People's Water Campaign could illustrate or support or be in solidarity with acts of practical reverence. And lastly, I'll just add that I know that some on the call are familiar with the Nebe song and there are other other ways in which we can express our love and our, our, our care beyond the sentences and, and the written prose. And so I would also think this, I think song, I think singing are a shared experience of that form of, of care and devotion and, and recognition and respect. So I think Maybe there could be a song that we could be singing, uh, either an existing song or create a song, uh, a different song, whatever. So those are some, those are some ideas off, off the top of my head. Um, and yeah, thanks for the question. I'd love to hear people's feedback or other questions from today's uh, participants. Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, and as, as you know, we, we've, what we've landed on that we will be presenting is, is an invitation to consider more deeply. We're no, nowhere near the place of having an actual statement. I, I understand more deeply now how much more that will take, but it, it's an opportunity for, you know, the bulk of myself and my colleagues were predominantly settler folks in this area, inspiring, aspiring to become water advocates and understanding that that and, and in the words here too, how much more deeply we need to 
and, and can be invited into relationship with her, with Nibby herself, with water herself, and particularly with people of, of, of the indigenous people of the lands on which we now call home. Um, there, was, there was one question that came through the chat and I'm wondering if you have a response for this, Tasha. There was a, a student um, from Wiki yeah. who asked, how, how do you see the future of water walks adapting in COVID-19? Yes. Question. Yeah, I saw that. Um, just before I answer that, though, I think it's really important when you're talking about language, um, you know, the language of the territory that you're situated within, you should be learning that. Um, so if you're situated within Haudenosaunee territory, you need to learn one of those Haudenosaunee languages, right, of the Six Nations. If you're situated in, in Plains Cree territory, then you should be learning the language of that territory. So if you're thinking about creating any kind of declaration um, and, and you're only using English, again, that's a privileged, <laughs> you know, you're coming at that from a privileged perspective. Um, and so, and even the songs, you know, we have songs, we have songs that have been sung for thousands of years. Um, we have a song that's very public. We have a song by um, Doreen Day and her, her, grand, her grandchild who created that song um, for the water. And, and you can hear that song online. It's been taped. Um, we've encouraged people to learn it through the water walks. Um, and it's the water song, water we love you, water we respect you, water we thank you, right? Um, so just, just to think about that, when you're thinking about language and you're thinking about words, you also need to think about the original languages of this land um, and these waters. In terms of, of the COVID-19 reality, you know, we've, we've, had, we've had the prophecies about the time that we're in. Our, our old people have told us and they've prepared us for some time. And even on the water walk, all the way from, from Matan to Duluth, you know, we had the honor of... Um, of being able to stop and visit with with many elders and and they said the same thing no matter they were disconnected they'd never met one another different nations and they all had that same message and so you know we do have to adapt and we do have to we have to respect that virus um, you know our our old people say not to necessarily fear it but respect the power that it has and so you know, if you've been on a water walk, you know that it can be, we can form it, so to speak, so that you would be automatically socially isolating, right? Uh, it depends on how you structure it. The element of the ceremony itself, um, the, the, the water can be carried by two individuals, by one individual, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as a Anishinaabe um, person who identifies as a woman, I often had to carry the pail and the staff the Eagle staff because there, there simply wasn't enough, um, enough men who stepped forward to carry that Eagle staff. And so, you know, in, in that instance, and, and you see, you know, when, when Josephine Buff first started out, she was by herself, her and her sister, um, um, Melvina, her and her and, and, and her sister Melvina, they were often alone. Like those early grandmothers, they didn't have any kind of support. They didn't, they, they were just alone. And so, you can create ceremony um, with the COVID, like with this COVID reality, I, I can see it. I mean, you, you need people to, to guide you, of course. Um, you need those grandmothers to guide you, but you know, you could wear a mask potentially. You might not gather together, you know, 20 to 30 people or a hundred people, 200 people as we've had in, in, in the past with some of the water walks, but you could do it with a smaller group of people um, with that understanding. I, I, I think we are so resilient and we are so adaptive as Indigenous peoples. Our history has shown us that. And I think moving forward, um, you know, we're, we're, quite, we're quite brilliant and we'll find the ways that we need to, to honor, um, to honor those, those relationships with the water. So I can see the little chat come up. Um, yeah, there seems to be a question there for you, Tasha. Do, do, uh, do we need photographs? I actually, well, always, we usually do take photos. Um, I don't know if I, I would personally need, I'm not planning any, well, maybe I am. <laughs> maybe there is a water walk in the near future for me. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, if you have existing photos, um, 
I'm, I'm not I'm not quite clear on the question because it's like Tasha do you need photographs video or drone footage um, we have we have in the past we've had different people step forward to do the photography I have a huge amount of, of photos um, and videos but but yeah if people are are yeah we would definitely I'd be open to to working with people um, depending on on where we were and what we were doing um, yeah I hope that yeah, kind of thanks. answers the question. Um, I, you know, this one is more sort of a re reflection that I'm having in this moment. Invite any comments on that too, which is, you know, I, I'm hearing and I think I believe I understand and have personal experience myself with feeling the difference when, when I allow myself into relationship with the waters that sustain me. Um, right here, I, I live by the Aramasa River and I've lived along her for the last 13 years and have, a, have a, a very deep relationship with her. And I know internally how it's impacted me in even the way that I might speak about it or the ways that I want to advocate for, for her and for my children and myself. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I'm hearing the invitation in your words as well, Tasha, about you know, making sure that, you know, that it starts so fundamentally with our relationship that way and our relationship with the Indigenous peoples of the lands we are currently residing on. And seeing the ways that, um, that those become rituals in my own personal life, my, when I go to the river and speak to her or sing to her, um, it, there's an impact in me. And I can feel that really deeply personally and, and thankfully have had the opportunity to join several portions of the water walks as well myself and feel the impact deeply personally. Um, mm -hmm. And yet it's so hard for me to imagine in this current systems that we are in, how to influence and how to influence the governance structures that are there. And this is, in, in there is a question somewhere, but it's not one that I think has an exact answer. And, but I'd love to, to, to invite any reflections or thoughts on how we go beyond our current systems that are, that are in place in the, in the postmodern world that are not serving. Paul, do you want to go first on that one? <laughs> You were going to answer. I didn't think it was for me that question. Oh. Um, well, your thoughts first, and then I'll I'll answer. I, I would say, like, all I can come up with right now is um, when I think about policy and I think about the written word, I think about the bureaucracies that govern water. I think starting with language is key, so not privileging just English language, but also, you know, I was I was at a water ceremony on uh, in Duluth. Uh, Anishinaabe woman from Fond du Lac Reservation, you know, used used the term when she took some water from the lake for ceremony and talked about orphaning that water, and it really made me reflect on on that relationship when we when we separate water from its body and all the rest of it. And mm -hmm. I know we have a lot of rules around, anyways. And so I'm just um, I'm thinking about language, and I'm just thinking about how we can start to shift away from the ideas of permits and and you know cubic feet of water and thinking about water as bodies and and, and our bodies as water and thinking about yeah that that idea of water orphaning the water and how that again creates a kinship relationship so much of the english language is is, is object based and so i think from a, if we are going to use English, uh, using English language as respectfully as we can to to describe and to honor the relationships that we are talking about, not just the things. And so I wish that water policy and water governance, even written in English and even written by these colonial institutions for now, can shift their words. Um, and so uh, maybe some and maybe some singing as well. So I'll I'll I'll, I'll start and end there. Um, thank you for that, Miigwech Kananaskomten. I, I think it's really, um, you know, as as a grassroots activist and as a grandmother and as a midday um, you know, I advocate 
out of a space of love and kindness, but I also advocate out of a space that um, understands we have uh, inherent sovereign rights um, and obligations um, connected to to our own systems and and that's where I think the larger um, the larger non indigenous society needs to um, educate themselves within the context of of our shared history and with the context of the fact that we haven't forgotten right like we when you're talking about you're talking about um, we're still working inside a, an actively colonial context, right? We're still acting um, within a space that does not want us to be present. And, and we see that. We see that um, in, in the East. I mean, I, someone, I will mention it first because that, that, is, that is on all of our minds right now as Indigenous people. You know, you've got the Mi'kmaq people that nation standing up and saying, we have this, this obligation and we have this ancestral right to, to feed our families, to generate our own economy. But our presence and our existence to do that threatens the very structure of, of what this country is built on. And, and so, you know, if we were to, to, to pull it all down, it, Canada, as you know, it wouldn't exist, right? We wouldn't be operating underneath a colonial government. We have our own nations. We have our own sovereign understanding, nation to nation, and we're not all the same, right? The, the Mi'kmaq down east are going to have, have a different set of, of understandings than, than the Plains Cree or the Anishinaabe, right? So the recognition that there is a diversity, but for thousands of years, we have existed as sovereign nations and, and colonialism has, has interrupted that. But maybe I'm, I'm really bitter. <laughs> maybe I'm not bitter is the word, but, but jaded. Cause I, I honestly don't see how, how we're going to, 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 to come to that, that nation to nation relationship with, without people giving up their power, without people giving up, um, yeah, without people giving up their power and, and their dollars. And, you know, we have our own work to do as Indigenous people, and we're doing that work. You know, we're training our young ones. We're, we're rooting our young ones in our, in our languages and in our understandings and in our knowing and in our ways of, of moving through the world. We've done that for thousands of years, and it has served us continually well. We're still here. And so we're still continuing those those obligations and, and, and our obligations and responsibilities to the rest of creation, right? Like we, we haven't forgotten what, what, what our original instructions have been as Indigenous people, but I, I, I honestly think that the, you know, there are some things that as non-Indigenous settlers, you're going to have to deal with, right? There should be, there should be, there shouldn't be hundreds of Indigenous people flocking to, to the Mi'kmaq territory. It should be settlers calling in your own people, right? Saying this is not right a and showing up, <laughs> right? Showing up and, and, and that's, that's, that shouldn't be our fight, right? That shouldn't be. The Mi'kmaq fishermen that are standing up and then the Mi'kmaq nation, that they shouldn't be having to, that should be other settlers saying, you know what, this is, this is not, this is wrong. And, and we see that over and over and over and over again. In the meantime, we're, so we're working, we're working on our languages, we're working on protecting the water, we're working on, you know, healing our nations from, from that colonial interruption and that colonial impact. Like we're, we're busy. We don't have time to go and educate settlers. We don't have time to be, so there, there's a role there that I think non-Indigenous people have to step into and step more into. If you understand, and if you don't understand what those what what those agreements were made by your by your respective ancestors, then you need to go into the places and find that education. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if that answers the question either. But that's that's fabulous. Thank you, Tasha. Thanks for the the the, the firm and important challenge 
to you know to us as uh, settler folks that are you know purporting to be water advocates and we have a lot of work to do and i appreciate the challenge and and you know i'm looking forward to being part of a, a a movement of people who are willing to take that challenge up and and to do the work so thank you for that i'm wanting to make sure uh, thanks for for those who continue to pop some comments into the chat including some good resources that paul has has included there and thanks for all the comments there i want to be a, a good steward of your time and realizing we are we are sitting at 11 33 right now so um, I think I think maybe we, we're at a point where we can wrap up the conversation. And my sincere thanks to to both of you uh, for for joining us today and and for starting this and grounding this work um, that we need to to do at a much deeper level going forward. I'm so grateful for your time. And I wanted I'll, I'll, I'll come back and say a little bit more of my thanks in a moment. But I just wanted to remind and invite everyone to consider joining. Uh, I'm gonna just pull it up and I'm sorry, I'm gonna read this here just cause I wanna make sure I get it right. That on September 26th, we are hosting our Watershed 2020 event. Um, sorry, I gotta pull my notes here again. And uh, this is an exciting online virtual convention um, bringing together people working towards water justice in Ontario. Uh, the convention includes 12 workshops led by community leaders on the front lines of water protection. And, and again, I'm going to just prioritize that a lot of this is um, in the, main, the mainstream environmental sector of predominantly white settler folks. And uh, really, really glad we're having these kinds of conversations to, to bring into every single webinar or workshop that we host that day. Um, Convention will also include a workshop on decolonization, a workshop on grassroots campaign to protect water, watershed and Great Lakes protection, and strategies to fight aggregate extraction in your community. Um, we will have some presentations from Ontario's political parties on water protection priorities. We've sent some questions out to uh, representatives from the four major political parties. Jeff Urich, the Minister of the Environment, will be present. Mike Schreiner from the Green Party, Leader will be present, Ian Arthur, NDP environment critic, and Lucille Collard, liberal environment critic, will be present to answer some questions. And we'll have a live performance by singer Alicia Brilla. And um, like this webinar, Watershed 2020 is a part of the People's Water Campaign, a broad-based initiative to restore environmental protections for water security and to help build the movement for water justice in Ontario. Watershed 2020 will represent the end of the first phase of the People's Water Campaign and set, and set as us up the second phase for working towards water justice. And we hope you can join you. You can find more information on the link um, that I think that Danny will pop into our chat box if you need to learn more. So just back for one moment, I just wanted to once again, just extend my very sincere gratitude to, to you, Paul, for joining us and for taking the time to itemize the, the declarations um, that you shared with us today and help us frame, uh, you know, a, a knowledge and some questions around what declarations are composed of, what ones are existing, and ways that we can imagine moving with one or some going forward. And and Tasha, I want to I want to thank you for your your impactful um, words, and, and and it's so clear to me uh, that you know you 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 move in those worlds of water um, relationship and are encouraging, I feel it so deeply. And I, I believe I heard in the comments um, that people were popping into the chat that they were very moved. And I am so grateful for your reflections and for your challenges. And, and we take them seriously and take them to heart. I, I'm taking them deeply in my heart. I also want to say a shout out and a thank you to our amazing duo, Megan and Danny, who handle all the behind the scenes uh, pieces on the lead up and during this uh, presentation. I just don't know where <laughs> we'd be without you. So huge props and thanks to, to Danny and Megan. Um, I want to take a moment to thank all of you who've taken time to attend this today and to be willing to engage in this very, very important conversation about how um, we want to move this conversation about water justice forward. Thanks for taking time to join us and we're always welcome to feedback and, and any input 
that you may wish to share with us along the way. Um, and I think last, but, but certainly not least, I wanted to uh, thank the reason why we're here in the first place, and that is to send my, my heartfelt thanks and gratitude uh, for, for, for the source of my life, the source of my daughter's life, the source of all of life and life itself, uh, which is uh, water and nibe, as I'm learning to, to call it. Gratitude, deep, deep gratitude to water and for the power that it has to bring so many of us together to have such important conversations. So without that, I, I, with that, I just wish you all a beautiful day and um, invite you to, uh, as we've heard from Tasha say, you know, po possibly find a moment today and possibly every day to, where possible to, to take a moment to be in reflection, visit uh, the waters nearby you, Perhaps you, you, perhaps that's possible, or perhaps it's the water that's coming from your tap. To so just take a moment to be in relationship with her um, from a place of such profound gratitude. Thank you, and have a beautiful day, everyone. Miigwech, miigwech, everyone. Shout out to all of the water protectors out there, and to all of those who are standing up um, for the moose. Uh, I forgot to mention there's a moose moratorium um, by the Algonquin Nation asking people to stop. Um, yeah, I think it's it's uh, it's a beautiful time. We we can make that change. We can shift. And I just want to um, say miigwech. And uh, I really encourage you take your little ones out for a walk along the river. Look up the Nibe song by, by Doreen Day. We'll put a link in the, in the chat here. And uh, I really express uh, my love and gratitude to all of you for, for listening and taking part today. And we'll see you soon, another time, another place. Nahal, miigwech.